Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to South Haven First United Methodist Church at 723 Star Landing Road East. Good to see all everyone in the house of the Lord here this morning in the sanctuary. And it's also good to have the folks that are joining us online this morning. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous Sunday morning. And the sun is shining outside and I promise you the sun is shining inside this morning. Amen. Just a few announcements this morning. If you haven't uh, caught up with your pledges or with your tithes and offerings, please try to do so. And if you can't be here in person to deliver them, then uh, Jerry's got the address up on the screen this morning, so please take time to do that. Yesterday, we had our fall festival, and the good Lord blessed us with an absolutely beautiful day. We had good crowds all day long, and many thanks to Ruth Williams Hooker for um, planning that and organizing it and many thanks to the church members who showed up yesterday uh, to help out also and we had quite a crowd of church members here yesterday helping out. It was just a really, really good fun day. Bible studies continue uh, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock if you could be here and if you can't get out at night then come Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. It's the same Bible study and uh, Still in the book of John. So come and join us. I'm trying. Still in the book of John. Birthday's coming up this week. Mark Moore has one on the 21st. I think that's tomorrow. So if you see Mark, be sure and wish him a happy birthday. And I don't, uh, I don't see any other announcements. Or I will tell you that uh, we've got a couple of weddings coming up shortly. Justin uh, Jackson uh, is getting married, I think, on the... October the 2nd. The 3rd. The third, the get third. married on the 3rd. Mm -hmm. And uh, two people are sitting in the sanctuary this morning. In case you don't know, Ken Waters and Audrey are getting married on the 10th. <laughs> and I wanted to share that with you. Try, it's the reason I was a little slow getting up here this morning, Brother Sam. I turned to them and said, do you mind if I share with the congregation the good news this morning in case that some that don't, that uh, didn't know about it? And they shook their heads, yes. So, uh, boy, that, that, if that doesn't put a smile on your face, I, something's wrong with you. Yeah. I just tell you, cause we're extremely happy for both of these two fine people. Yeah. So, our uh, first hymn, the only hymn this morning is Sweet, sweet spirit. It's number 334 in your hymnal, and it'll also be on the screen behind me. Jim and the welcome announcements and our opening hymn. Thank you, Jim. Bethel always been a part of our opening part of our service. We're glad y'all are back as well. We missed you, so 
Glad y'all were able to make it back safely from out the storms and everything. So thank y'all for being back here with us. We do appreciate it. And I want to thank all of you, and along with Ruth, who were able to come and help yesterday. But I want to tell you, the highlight of yesterday truly was the moment that Cheryl Young became our karaoke queen. She got up there and sang, and she did a wonderful job with that. So we're very, it was very entertaining to hear her. I forgot what song you sang, but anyway, it was a good one. So anyway, but thank all of you for being a part of all that with us and being with us here today. We're going to continue on in our service now with our affirmation of faith. It'll be on the screen behind me. And it's based on Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and then verses 37 through 39. So I invite you to please join me as we affirm our faith together as the body of Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father. now to please join me in a time of prayer. Of course, all the needs we shared with you yesterday upon uh, with our phone message system. Very thankful to have so many of you here, special ones there, been out sick as well. Glad to have them back with us and those that are just have been out for a while coming back now. We're so thankful to have you here with us. Of course, let us continue to remember all the things that are going on. So much going on in our lives right now from the people being sick from COVID and our essential workers, our frontline workers, those everybody, from doctors and nurses to custodians and hospitals and, and doctor's offices to the personnel, the ones that run the office. We want to continue praying for them. You know, they're the ones also got to be there right in the midst of it. So the office workers even and for the doctors and the hospitals and so many others. As we also continue to lift up, don't forget the men and women of our armed forces, our fire departments, especially our police officers and police departments who really need our love and support at this time. And let's don't forget our nation. A lot of stuff going on too as well. And we need, we need a revival, don't we? We need a revival. And God's the one that can bring in. It's up to us, God's people. We need to be doing this. We need to be praying for God, asking for that revival. So invite you to let that also be a part of our prayer time together. So whoever it is, you at home, those here at this time, wherever it is that God's laying on your heart, I invite you just to give it now to God and give that person to God. And Beth Ellen is going to play and take us now together to the throne of grace. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you as always for this beautiful gift of prayer. For being able to lay ourselves open, our hearts open, our spirits open to you. 
And so, dear God, be with all these needs now that we have given to you, placed into your loving, life-giving hands. And just reveal yourself now. We need you in our lives. We need you to reveal yourself in the life of, our, of this nation, nation you have given to us, and also within this world. Bring revival, dear God, and let that revival start here at South Haven First United Methodist. Let it start here in our, the life of your church and in the, our very lives itself. So dear God, thank you for this time. For this time of worship, but most importantly at this moment, this time of prayer. And continue to be with us and lead us now as we gather one voice, one heart, one spirit. Lifting up the prayer that Jesus taught us so Pray with me now, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Invite now, Jerry's got a special video for us at this time. living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. 
Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with, along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look. I am about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Noah was now 601 years old. On the first day of the new year, ten and a half months after the flood began, the floodwaters had almost dried up from the earth. Noah lifted back the coverings of the boat and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Two more months went by, and at last the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, leave the boat, all of you, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, Release all the animals, the birds, the livestock, and the small animals that scurry along the ground so they can be fruitful and multiply throughout the earth. So Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives left the boat. And all of the large and small animals and birds came out of the boat pair by pair. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. And all of God's people everywhere said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Once again now, let us pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come into your presence now to thank you for this time that you've given us to be one with each other with you. Use this entire service now to bring us to that place we all need to be, desire to be, and that is to the foot of the cross of Jesus. And as we gather here, anoint us with your spirit. But as always, I stand here before you and before your church unashamed to ask for that double portion because I need it, dear God. Because as I stand here before your church, I don't want it to be my voice that's heard. I want it to be the voice of Jesus that rings true and strong in the, your church's ears and heart. But greater than that, dear God, I don't want it to be about me. I don't want them to see me. Instead, I want them to look upward. To look up towards you and to see Jesus now. To see Jesus who stands before us, bringing your message with power and strength. And so bless us now, dear God, as only you and you alone can do. And I ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the title of uh, this sermon that God has given me, he's also given me a great question that I believe we all need to ask ourselves each and every day of our lives. And that question, that title is, what does it mean to walk with God? Now, to help answer this question, have I ever told any of you or all of you as a church about the time when we moved to Wilmore, Kentucky, so that I could go to seminary. Now, I apologize. I know there's some individuals. I know Jim and Beth Dunn have heard this. I know that I probably have shared this in my Sunday school class, and I'm pretty sure it's come up at a Wednesday night or Thursday morning Bible study, but 
I hope that there are some of you at home and some of you who are here that I haven't told this story to. But how when we got ready to move to Kentucky, the first thing that Sandy said was that she didn't want me to try and find a church to work in. She didn't want me to work. She wanted me to stay home, first off, so I could you know, concentrate on my studies. Secondly, so I'd be there for trade to help take care of him. So she made the decision that she would get the job. Well, we had gone up about a month or two before we were officially moving, and while we there, we went through all through the Wilmore, Nicholasville, and Lexington, Kentucky areas, passing out her resume. By the time we made our move, three different dentists had already contacted her, wanting her to come in for an interview. Well, we were once again blessed to be able to get all three of her interviews set on the same day. Now, the night before we went for the interviews, we sat down together and we did two things. First off, we prayed. We prayed for God to give us his wisdom and understanding so that she would find the dentist that he wanted her to work with. And then secondly, we took a look at our finances. And we looked and we went over them and we concluded that for us to get by, <laughs> okay, for us to get by, she would need this large amount of money of making $8.50 an hour. That's how much we would need. Remember, now, this was 1996. But she would need $8.50 an hour. And we prayed about that, asking God to let that be a sign. Well, the next day we got up, and 10 o'clock that morning, we went to the first dentist there in Wilmore. Now, he was an older man, an older dentist, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when we walked in, first thing Sandy says, it smells. It didn't smell very good. And then she started looking around, and she saw that a lot of his equipment was old. It was outdated. And he was very nice, and he told Sandy he would love for her to come and work with him, and that he could pay her $8 an hour. Well, now, that wasn't exactly what we prayed for, was it? But what went through our mind was that she's only five minutes away. In fact, she was so close, she could walk with Trey to school in the morning time, drop him off, and then go on to work. Or if it was bad cold weather, she could drive there in five minutes. Save us some money, what, on gas and wear and care of the car? Kind of made sense. Is that God's $8.50? Well, we save that much per hour. Well, we told him thank you, but we let him know something the next day or two. That afternoon after lunch around 1 o'clock, we then drove up into Lexington. And there, she had an interview with a husband and wife dental team. Now, I tell you, their clinic was top notch. They had all the modern stuff. They had this big place, had several hygienists already, a number of different assistants, and everybody was great. People were coming up saying, hope you'll come and work with the Sandy, and, you know, being super nice. And the couple, they sat down with Sandy, and they wanted her, they were so impressed with her resume that they offered her $9 an hour. Wow, God, you are really blessing us, but... Then we had to think, okay, but that's like a, it was like a 30 to 40 minute drive into Lexington. A little more gas, some wear and tear on the car, but $9 is $9, right? So we tell them also, listen, we need to pray about this. We'll let you know something the next day or two. Well, her third interview that day was with Dr. Amanda. And it was at the end of the day, around 5 o'clock. Well, Trey and I, Trey was in the third grade. We had gone with her to these interviews, so at 5 o'clock, we're in the waiting room with Dr. Amanda's clinic, and they come and get her, and she goes back, and two hours later, she finally comes out. <laughs> now, Trey and I are about to lose our minds at this point. You know, I'm trying to keep him entertained, but also, you don't know what's going on back there. The thing is this, two hours later, she walks out, and you know what? She's crying. You can tell she's been crying for a while. She is crying her eyes out then. And I immediately run up to her. Sandy, what's wrong? Let's get in the car. I'll tell you when we get there. 
So we get into the car. Now, if you know Sandy, the first thing Sandy does is she begins to apologize. I'm so sorry I made you and Trey wait two hours. Sandy is right, but I know it was why I shouldn't have made y'all wait that long or anything. But we just got to talking. And she began to tell us how, how they had so much in common and that they had just lost track of time. Well, after two hours, finally, Dr. Amanda brought up the subject. Well, we haven't talked about salary. Now, I remember this. She told Sandy, she said, now, originally, I was going to pay $8 an hour, but I have just fallen in love with you, and I think you would be great here. I want you to work for me. And so I am going to offer you $8.50 an hour to come and work for me. And it was at that moment that Sandy then burst into tears that she began to cry. In our scripture reading for today, what we have before us is that many believe is a story. A story about one of the greatest accomplishments to ever occur within the history of this entire world. But for me, I want you to know it's much more than that. Because the truth is this, if we only see this as a story, a story about a man who builds a big boat, if we see it as nothing more than a story about somebody that is an ark which is filled up with every kind of male and female animal known in the world and then survives a flood that doesn't cover just a small area, but a flood that covers the entire world, then we've missed the complete message of this story. We've missed out on what it's all about. Because for me, what makes this story so special it's because it is a great example of what can happen within the life of a person, a life of any individual who makes his choice, the choice to walk with God. But what was it? What is really going on here then? You see, what we actually have is a story about faith, a story about faith and a story about righteousness. It's a story about what can happen when we choose to be both faithful and righteous within our own relationship with God. And so what we need to do to understand really everything that's going on is that we then need to ask ourselves, so what was it then? What was it that helped Noah to be able to fully and completely walk with God? Well, I believe that as we look at this story, we're going to discover three ways. Three ways that not only helped Noah to walk with God, but we're also going to discover three ways, or you know i got to say it, three steps, because we're walking with God. Three steps that you and I can also take so that we can do the very same thing in our lives each day. How we, too, can also walk with God. So what are these three steps that we need to take? Well, for me, the first one is found there in chapter 6, verse 8, where we read, but Noah found favor with the Lord. But Noah found favor with the Lord. Now, I don't know where this story came from. I discovered it, made a copy of it years ago, so I wish I could tell you where, where I got it from. But it's one of these stories that just made a big impact on me. And it's a story about the days before modern navigational equipment. Back in the day when iron ships traveled across the Atlantic Ocean. And as they did this, these iron ships would actually use two compasses. Now, one compass was fixed to the deck right there in front of the sailor who was at the wheel of the ship so that that sailor could see it. But the second compass was placed at the top of the main mast of the ship. And there would always be a sailor at the top watching it. One day, a passenger that was on one of these kinds of iron ships that was crossing the Atlantic, he stopped and he asked the captain, why does the ship have two compasses? Well, the captain told the passenger that the ship, being made out of iron, that the compass on the deck 
sometimes it becomes affected by its surroundings. But such was not the case for the compass that's attached to the top of the mast. And then he said this, it is not influenced by its, by its surroundings. And so we actually steer the ship by the compass above. By the compass above. You see, for me, this is exactly what Noah did in finding favor with God. You see, Noah found favor with God because he did not make the same mistake that everybody else back in his time was making. The same mistake that too many people today keep making. You see, Noah found favor with God because he did not seek the favor of those who were around him. He did not seek the favor of, of when we say favor, the better word is approval. He did not seek the approval of people. In fact, he did not need their approval. Most importantly, he didn't want it. He didn't need it, and he didn't want their approval. He didn't concern himself with uh, how, about, how others thought about him or what they said about him. He didn't need the approval of his neighbors or his so-called friends that stood there and mocked him, called him an idiot, called him a fool for building a boat in the middle of dry land. It didn't bother him. He did not need their approval. But most importantly, Noah did not allow himself to be influenced. He wasn't influenced by the things or the people that surrounded him. And Noah was able to do this. Why? Because he didn't keep his eyes on the things of the world. He didn't keep his eyes on the people that were around him. Instead, he did what? He kept his eye on the compass that was above him. For me, it's the same way with Jesus. Remember how Jesus, when he was arrested, taken away from trial, yes, they beat him. They took that crown of thorns and smashed it onto his head. But they also stood there and they mocked him. They laughed at him. They called him names. And the thing is, it didn't end when he got to the cross. They still continued, continued to stand there, shout out, mock him, make fun of him, laugh at him. But you see, instead of looking at them, instead of focusing upon the thousands of angels that were standing at the edge of heaven itself, waiting for him just to call them down, they could kill everybody and save him from that cross. No, instead he did what? He kept his eyes on the cross. He kept his eyes on the one who is the true compass that is above. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. The thing is, when I think about this, I have to wonder, how many times have you and I stepped out of God's favor? How many times have we stepped out of favor with God? Because when God called us to do something, the first thought, the first thing that crosses our mind is something like, well, I wonder what people are going to think about. I wonder what people are going to say about me if I do what God wants me to do. Friends, how many blessings have we missed out in our lives because we were too worried about what other people think? How many blessings have we failed to give to somebody else? God is saying, go to that person, do this for him, do this for her, and we stop ourselves because, well, I'm worried about what other people are going to say about me. Friends, Noah wasn't worried. Look what he did. Jesus wasn't worried and look what he did. Both these men, they walked with God. Why? Because they didn't focus on the things of the world. They kept their eyes on the compass above. How many blessings have you and I missed out in our lives? Because we took our eyes off the compass and was worried about the things of the world. To walk with God means to keep your eyes on the compass above. That's the first thing we must do. What's the second one? There, also in chapter 6 here in verse 22, the second step that helped Noah was that he faithfully obeyed God's commandments. Now, did you hear what I just told you? I did not tell you that he obeyed God's commandments. Did you hear what Noah did? Did you hear what I said? I told you that he faithfully obeyed God's commandments. 
Well, preacher, how do you know this? Well, the scripture tells us he did everything that God told him to do exactly the way he was told to do it. That's being faithfully obedient to God. And as a result, look what Noah did. Look at what he ended up accomplishing. He and his sons built by hand something that had never been built or seen by anyone else up to this point. Like the Bible tells us, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. I've been told what? About almost two football fields. But it did more than that. It stood up to a flood. It covered the world. And inside it, it held thousands of pairs of animals from around the world, including Noah and his family. And it did what? It kept them dry. It kept them safe. But it didn't end there. It also held enough food for all the animals and people to last what? Over 12 months. Let's be honest here. Let's think about it. Because was this art, though? Was this art the truly magnificent thing that Noah accomplished in being completely, faithfully obedient to God? Well, the answer to that question can't be found in this scripture. Instead, we've got to go to Hebrews. We've got to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, where the preacher, the author of Hebrews, he tells us there in 11, 7, and by his faith, we see that he, Noah, saved the world that had been condemned because of its sin and became the heir of righteousness. That was according to faith. Now, what is the preacher really telling us here? What is he saying in that verse? Well, for me, what it means is this, that because of his faithful obedience, Noah became part of something greater than building an ark. He became a bigger part of a bigger plan than building an ark that saved all the animals and his family. Now, what I believe the preacher is saying is it's because of his faithful obedience that Noah became a part of a greater plan, God's plan of salvation for the world. The plan of salvation that first off shows that God would never give up on us. But it's a plan of salvation that actually starts then with Noah's faithfulness. But the beautiful part is then brought into completion by the faithfulness of Jesus himself. They walked with God. Noah walked with him, and he helped start the plan of salvation. Jesus walked with God, and he helped bring the plan of salvation into existence, into completion. The sad part is this, though, how many times have you and I failed to share God's plan of salvation? How many times have you and I, we failed that same plan of salvation that brought us together, all of us together today, we're here because of God's plan of salvation. And how many times have we failed to share God's plan of salvation? Why? Because we failed to be faithfully obedient. How many times have we done that? Aren't you glad Noah was faithful? Aren't you glad Jesus was faithful? We would not be here if it wasn't for that. But how many blessings, how many times have we failed the plan? The same plan that brought you and me, all of us together today, we failed because we failed to be obedient, faithfully obedient. The second step, walking with God means you must be faithfully obedient to God. Which then brings us to the third one. For me, the third step is found in chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. Noah was willing to trust in God so that he could patiently wait on God. Now that's good stuff, folks. That's worth the price of admission as far as I'm concerned. That's good stuff. If you get anything out of the sermon, I want you to remember this third step. It's so good, i got to read it again. So listen to this. Noah was willing to trust in God so that he could patiently wait on God. Now, as I've been talking about earlier, one of the biggest mistakes that we make when it comes to our relationship with God is when we seek the favor, the approval of people 
instead of the favor of God. The thing is, we're human and it doesn't end there. Our second biggest mistake that we make is when we jump the gun too fast, which causes us to actually then jump out of the will of God. Now, what am I talking about here? Think about it for a moment. What if Noah had done one of these two things? First off, what if he had jumped out of the ark before the floodwaters were gone? What if he got up one day and said, I'm tired of this, and he opened up the doors of the ark, or he went up to that top part, opened it up, and jumped out? Well, if he had jumped out of that ark while the floodwaters were still there, he'd have done what? That's right, he'd have drowned like everybody else. Or if he'd opened the doors too soon, the whole ark would have gone under with it, and everything would have been lost. But let's look at that and also look at it like this. What if he jumped out of that ark while the ground was still soaked from the flood water? You know, a year full of water, you're going to be pretty wet, be pretty muddy. What if he had jumped out of that ark before the ground had drowned up, had dried up? Well, if he had jumped out while it was still soaking wet, first off, he'd have landed probably up to his hip in the mud. But then worse, he would have started sinking. And he would have been lost under the mud. That's what would have happened if he had jumped out too quick. But because Noah was willing to trust in God, that meant he was also willing to wait on God. And when he waited on God, what happened to Noah, the family, his family, and all the animals? Well, as we see, they were able to do what? to walk out onto dry, solid ground. But greater than that, more importantly, they were able to leave that ark because now they were saved. They had now all been saved. You see, to walk with God means that we must be willing to wait on God. But too many five times, why we don't want to wait, we want to jump the gun, and we want to get there before God even gets there. The truth is, though, Jesus had to do the same thing, patiently waiting for the coming of the cross. Jesus trusted God and he patiently waited. Because, friends, you and I know this. We know this for a fact. Jesus knew about the cross before he started his ministry. Jesus knew about the cross. He knew that it was coming and he knew the pain that it was going to inflict on his body. And don't you know, in his human state, so many times he wanted to, he, I don't say he did it, but I feel like he probably just wanted to cry out, God, can't we get this over with? Father, can't we just let me go to the cross now? I know what's coming, and I'm tired, and I'm ready to get home. Can't we just let it happen now? What if Jesus had just gone to John the Baptist, got baptized, and said, okay, John, thanks, see you later. I'm headed to Calvary, and gone straight to the cross. And not waited like he was supposed to. Well, friends, there would have been no gospel. There would have been no Acts, which means no Paul, no Peter. There would have been no letters. There would have been no ending to the book. But you see, Jesus knew. Jesus knew he had to do more than just trust God, but he had to trust him so he could wait on him. Because in coming and waiting on God, he was then able to do what? He was able to tell us and teach us about who God is. About the love that God has for each and every one of us. And through his love, how he is there to forgive us of all of our sins. It wouldn't have happened if he hadn't patiently waited on God. The thing is, I wonder how many blessings we've missed out in our lives. Because we were so busy trying to get someplace before God got there. Jesus waited for to walk with God means you do more than just trust in Him. To truly walk with God means that you wait with God and you wait for God in your life each day. And so we have these three steps before us, but the bottom line is what does it really mean for each and every one of us? Well, let me finish telling you the rest of Sandy's story. Like I said, Sandy's there in the car and she's crying. And she tells me that Dr. Mandis offered her $8.50. And she's crying. And I'm like, well, what did Dr. Amanda say when you started crying? And 
She said, well, Dr. Amanda thought she had done something to upset me. She starts apologizing and saying, listen, I can try and get you more money if that's what you want. Uh, I can start you off at 50, maybe six months. I can give you a raise. She's trying to find out. She thinks she's upset, Sandy, that it's too low an amount. Sandy told me, she says, I finally was able to calm down enough to where I told her about what we prayed for. And that when she said $8.50, she instantly knew in her heart that this was the dentist that God wanted her to work with. And I said, well, that's great. But what did Dr. Amanda do when you told her all that? She said she leaned forward and put her arms around her neck and started crying with her. You see, Dr. Amanda is also a woman of faith, a strong Christian woman. She knew that the dental assistant she had was leaving, but you see, she was also not a Christian. Dr. Amanda started praying. She'd been praying for a while now, asking God to send her a Christian dental assistant. Oh, she had a number of different resumes that came in, and she said that she found herself several times tempted. Just go ahead and hire somebody. Get it over with, but every time she said she felt God telling her this is not the one, that he wanted her to wait and not hire anybody. Sandy took the job. And while we were there, two things happened. First off, she ended up, Sandy ended up having the best working relationship that she has had in her 40 plus years. Best working relationship in 40 plus years as a dental assistant. But something greater than that even happened. She also received one of the strongest spiritual relationships that she's also been blessed to be a part of in her time, in our time there. And this all came about, why? Because of two women who chose to do one thing, and that was to walk with God. Two women who did not seek the favor of the world. Two women who faithfully obeyed God. But most importantly, two women who trusted God so much that they patiently waited on God for His will in their lives. And friends, that's what this is about today. God is calling us to walk with Him. God calls us to walk with Him each day of our lives. And in doing this, He doesn't just say walk with me. He backs it with the most beautiful promise of all. That in walking with him, you never walk alone. That you're always with Jesus. That you're always with him. So the bottom line is, what do you need to do in your life today to walk with God? What do you need to do? Are, you, are there people you're too worried about impressing? They probably don't even know your life. Are you spending all your time trying to impress somebody that they know who you are? Are you spending all your time worried about what your neighbor is going to think or your the person you're sitting next to worries about what, what you're doing? When God calls you to be obedient, do you just kind of do it your way? Well, this will be good enough. Are you, mo are you like Noah and saying, I'm going to be faithful and obedient. I'm going to do it exactly the way that God tells me to do this. But more importantly, do you trust him so much that you're not jumping the gun in your own? But you're willing to wait for him and wait with him. What do you need to give up in your life today to become somebody that walks faithfully with God every day? The choice is now up to us. What will our choice be? Will we be a church? Will we be a people? Will we be Christians who truly seek to walk with God today? Are you going to get up and go on your way? Those at home, just do what else you want to do. Those of you in here are going to walk out the doors and walk on your own. Or will we walk with God today and go with Jesus in every day of our lives? The choice is now up to you and to me. What will it be? Our closing hymn, best one, goes with all of this. Beth Allen chose in the garden. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. What a beautiful message. We're going to sing this song. But first off, what I want to do is ask Beth Ellen just to play it through. Play it through one time. And during that time, I want you here who are here, bow your heads. Those of you who are at home, 
Bow your head right now. And ask God to reveal in your life the things you need to give to him. Since we're not opening up the altar, we're opening it up right here where you're sitting. And she's going to play it through. You know the words. And then we're going to sing the first two verses to close everything out. So those of you who are here, those who are home, listen to the music. And pray and ask God to teach you, show you where you need to walk with him. So Beth, let play it through one time. And then Jim will lead us in our closing two verses. She taught Sandy about the love of God. Uh, Dan was, what was it, Sandy? The, from Paralyzed from the neck down. When she met him. She met him that way. And she still fell in love with him. And was a wonderful example of the love of Christ in her relationship with him. Sandy's got some beautiful stories, so I know she would love to share with me anytime you want to. But again, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Sandy, for allowing me to use your story today. And now, Brothers and sisters of Christ, go forth in the love and peace of our Lord and Savior. Go forth to walk, forward to walk with God every day. To don't seek the favor of others. Don't just be obedient, be faithfully obedient. But more important, just to trust in Him and wait upon His will in your life. Go forth and walk with God. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for being here with us today. Goodbye. Y'all will hold up just a moment till we get it all turned on.